It wasn't easy to introduce economic reform in the Soviet Union. There were a whole lot of economic ministries. There were party organs in charge of the economy. There were factory managers up and down the country who were embedded in that system. Uh, I think it was a very difficult thing to do. Um, and if you moved to market prices, then of course prices would go up, prices of many essentials. And so it was difficult. It possibly could have been done, but it was easier in China where you simply had to liberate the peasants and let them grow what they wanted to grow. But China was an overwhelmingly peasant country, and by this time Russia was not. So the conditions are just very different in the Soviet Union. It may be that if Gorbachev had given total priority to economic reform, he could have got away with it. Uh, but um, I have some doubts about that. As you said, uh, uh, in different circumstances, it could have lasted decades longer, uh, communism in Europe. But could it have ended earlier than the period where it did from 89 to 91? We, after all, you know, just as a reminder to our viewers, we had a revolt in Eastern Germany in 1953, Hungary in 56, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia in 68, Poland from 79 on. Still, it continued. Communism in Eastern Europe could have ended very much earlier. What kept it going, of course, was the determination of the Soviet Union to sustain these regimes in East Central Europe. The, if people in Eastern Europe had not understood that behind their own unpopular rulers stood the might of the Soviet army and the Soviet Union ready and willing to use whatever means it took to maintain communist rule there, it would have ended far earlier. Czech, you mentioned the cases of Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany. Possibly only in Bulgaria would communism have continued um, uh, longer without this um, Soviet threat in the background. So as long as the Soviet Union had the determination to intervene to sustain these communist regimes, they would have continued. So brutal repression is actually what kept it in place. It was repression. It was also, of course, um, uh, some carrot as well as stick. Um, usually after there was um, uh, some unrest in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union would um, pour a lot of money in to try to improve the standard of living. This happened in Czechoslovakia in the early 1970s, for example. And Poland cost the Soviet Union a great deal of money. But in the final resort, it was a willingness to use force. We mentioned the, the role of Gorbachev there, but uh, what other personalities we could pick out that had some influence? Or what influence did personalities like uh, Pope John Paul II, Lech Wałęsa in Poland, uh, even Ronald Reagan with extreme right wing in the U.S. putting pressure how much did these people contribute to the overall change that took place? Well, when Ronald Reagan died, um, the American newspapers said, you know, this is the man who ended communism. And I think that's a gross exaggeration that um, Reagan's policy, hardline policy, um, in some ways helped to strengthen the hardliners in the Soviet Union. It's also misunderstanding Reagan, who thought of himself as a peacemaker, not a warmonger. And he made several overtures to Soviet leaders during his first term and was rebuffed. Um, <clears throat> he couldn't have any meetings with them because, as, as he said, these guys keep dying on me. Um, and so he finally found somebody he could talk to with Gorbachev and they came to some serious agreements. But um, the really important figure here was Gorbachev, not Reagan. Reagan coincided with four Soviet leaders, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernyanka and Gorbachev and nothing changed for the better, whether in East Europe or in East-West relations, until Gorbachev came along. As for Pope John Paul II, to have a formidable pope emerging from an East European country was a source of spiritual solace and political inspiration for many people in Eastern Europe, especially Poland. But again, without the changes in the Soviet Union, um, he couldn't have done it. When we look at the picture of communism in the world today, you know, when it, it's finished in Europe. Uh, even the communist parties that are left over they have practically no influence at all. But it still exists in countries like North Korea, uh, in China, obviously, with its own characteristics. Still in Asia, we have Vietnam and Laos, and Cuba, of course, closer to us in Brazil. Uh, I would imagine different reasons explain the survival of all these systems, but uh, 
Do you think there's also a common element that justifies them still being around? I think one common element is patriotism and the fact that the communist regimes have been able to play this patriotic card. Um, very often the enemy has been the United States, I mean, very obviously in the case of North Korea, and, uh, but equally obviously in the case of Cuba. Um, for a long time that was true of China as well, though of course now China and the United States have got rather a close relationship of economic interdependence. Um, so I think that that's one factor, that um, people, the, the successful communist regimes have managed to play the national or even nationalist card to some effect. Uh, you went to China this year, you were telling me, and you describe in your book, you describe uh, the system in China as a hybrid system obviously a, a mixed economy, almost like state capitalism, considering that half the economy is already in, the, in private hands. Still, the Communist Party has a monopoly of power there. But is that enough to characterize China as a communist country, still? Well, it depends which of the defining characteristics you want to put most emphasis on. Um, I think there's just enough to call it uh, communist because the Communist Party does have a monopoly of power. It's got strict discipline, the so-called democratic centralism. I mean, that's what went under Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. The party became a kind of debating society. That hasn't happened in China. At the same time, there is some real intellectual discussion within the Chinese Communist Party, and there is discussion of political reform, but partly they're very wary uh, of the Soviet experience. After all, in the Soviet Union, it ended with the disintegration of the Soviet state, and so even people in China who would like political reform don't want to finish up in that Soviet predicament. Uh, communism in Africa, uh, countries like Angola and Mozambique, uh, which were at one stage were under Communist Party control, was that a, simply a byproduct of the Cold War? Because as soon as the Cold War ended, you know, there went communism in these countries. I think it was largely a product of the Cold War that um, the small elites in these countries could um, appeal either to the Soviet Union or to the United States and get support and um, get material help. Uh, and there were some people there who, were, who believed that they were Marxists or Leninists and they also saw that Leninism was one way of maintaining an authoritarian control in a country. But, you know, there wasn't the mass base for a, a communist system. Even in the Soviet Union, some of the party intellectuals said, you know, well, we call these countries states of socialist orientation, but they're not ready for even a first stage of socialism. So, um, on the whole, I think, you know, these so-called communist regimes in Africa were nothing of the kind.